Hello. It's really a pleasure to be here. Bonjour. And uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you, well, the question we've been asking, how do we spread the benefits of AI and data? So let's start with a question. Have you ever asked, what does humanity want? If there was a KPI, key performance indicator for civilization, what would it be? Um, you know, we're doing things with synthetic biology with AI and so on. Where is it that we're going to end up? Well, it turns out um, that this has been answered in one particular way, which is pretty cool. It's a kind of a proxy for good. And amazingly, it was answered by the nations of the world getting together and agreeing over a number of months and years. And yes, it's the United Nations. In 2015, the United Nations announced the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. It's 17 KPIs, so it's multi-objective. And you can think of them together as a KPI or a goal for civilization. Uh, or, as a summary, how do we improve the planet for the better? It's things like no poverty, zero hunger, addressing climate change, and so on. And this has actually been, become the driving force behind where the UN is aiming for. Uh, and not just you know, the dozens of UN agencies out there, but also a wide variety of NGOs and other um, organizations that are working to help address these SDGs. Now, of course, uh, I, I, I actually come from the world of AI and blockchain. And uh, we've started asking as well, uh, what can we do about this? And it turns out others have too. They've asked, can AI help somehow? Can AI help to address these sustainable development goals for good? So uh, with this, there have been uh, some nice examples out there. Uh, AI to help predict deforestation. AI to help track livestock to reduce conflict. AI for microinsurance for crops in, in rural regions of the world. And that's for satellites, but also for, say, smart cities, right? Um, tailoring smart cities for more efficient transit systems, giving a voice to the voiceless and the homeless, modeling ec epidemics. So all of these are very nice examples of AI for good. And of course, this is great as sort of a counterweight uh, to the, the other narrative of simply AI to sell you more ads. So to me, this is the narrative that I choose, that I prefer, AI for good. And uh, it's actually also been growing into a global movement. Um, there is something called the AI for Good Global Summit. The first one was in 2017. Uh, about a dozen UN agencies showed up. Uh, last year was the second. This upcoming year is the third. Uh, it's with the ITU, which is the communications arm of, of the UN, XPRIZE Foundation, ACM, and others. And uh, well, it's basically become its own meme. So that must mean something, right? Uh, so the question is, can AI help towards these SDGs? And the answer is yes. We've seen several examples. But have we seen examples that are happening on a world scale yet? Again and again, repeating and repeating. You know, we have 10 or 20 examples, but wouldn't it be cool if we had 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 where AI can help improve humanity according to these KPIs across the board? This is a challenge. Why? Because the people that have the problems are generally not the people that have the ability to solve the problems specifically. So the problem solvers are the AI researchers and the data scientists of the world, you know, the PhD students in their, in their labs. Um, and especially when you're a first year or second year PhD student, you're a little scared to leave the lab, right? Um, and then the problem owners, uh, this might be in rural Canada or maybe in your backyard here or whatever. Um, and, you know, there's a long stand standing idea of, you know, just uh, get out of the office, look around and talk. And I think the AI world um, is probably just learning this now that it's going to be helpful. But still right now, there's a gap between the people with the problems, uh, whether it be in satellites or, or, or forestry or, or whatever, and the AI researchers. What can we do about that? How do we scale AI for good to get to these 100 or 10,000 problems that we might want to solve? So let's flesh out what the problem looks like a bit more. There's not just the problem owners and problem solvers. Uh, the problem owners have access to data in some form, to generating data and so on. Um, quite often, it's different people with the data, but they're talking a little bit. That data, of course, is being stored somewhere, sometimes in the cloud and so on. And then the people that are the problem solvers, uh, because they're AI folks, uh, they need some data to work with, generally, for building their regression models, their classification models. And they need storage and compute to store the data, um, to, do, to build the, the TensorFlow neural networks and so on. So this is starting to flesh out the ecosystem to understand what's going on. But overall, then, once you start fleshing it out, you can ask, OK, let's have a low friction substrate that connects all of these. Right? Let's connect the data owners with the storage and compute and the problem owners all feeding towards the problem solvers and, um, and actually connecting back and forth and back and forth, because it really is truly bidirectional. 
So imagine if you have a public uh, utility network as connective tissue, a network that is sort of like the waterworks or the internet or electricity. It's just there. No single entity owns or controls it. It's really, truly a public utility. Wouldn't that be cool to help scale AI for good? So the question is how? What does that look like? Well, it turns out that that technology now exists. Blockchains. Blockchains are public utility networks. Let's think about Bitcoin for, for a second. So Bitcoin was released about 10 years ago now, actually, um, by a random anonymous hacker or many people. And she, or maybe Team Satoshi, um, created this thing and put it out into the wild. And it's just out there as a utility. No single entity owns or controls it. A whole bunch of people use it um, daily, monthly, whatever. Uh, and it's almost become its own life form. Uh, you can send transactions to it, you can receive, you can store Bitcoin, and it's um, emerging. Uh, many, many people are excited about the possibility of, of Bitcoin becoming even the world reserve currency. But it's something that no government can turn off, no single individual can turn off. Um, it's really going to be something that's resilient over time. So Bitcoin is a public utility network built on top of the internet, TCP IP, uh, which is also its own public utility network. But we don't need to stop at Bitcoin or the, the internet itself, we can keep going. We can say, what else are blockchains useful for as public utility networks? And what about this then? What if we had a public utility network that could connect all these folks, that connects the problem owners with the problem solvers, as well, of course, the other, uh, the other actors that have the data, that have the storage and compute? What might that look like? Well, um, it would really be a substrate for an AI commons. An AI commons where it's a commons as in a shared resource among many, many actors in the ecosystem. You know, not just 10 or 100, but 1,000 or, or 10 million or 10 billion. So let's hold that thought for a, a second and say, OK, there's this, we can have this blockchain substrate to connect as a public utility network. But how does this relate to AI and AI for good um, beyond just connecting these? So I'm going to talk briefly about data, and then I'll connect the dots. So back in 1997, I got my very first job where people paid me to do AI research. And I was overjoyed. Up till then, I just been hacking on my own. And I was given a data set, 20,000 data points. It was time series data. And I had to classify between 13 different classes, people walking, birds flying, tanks driving, and so on. And at the, this, it was a summer job, four-month summer. And uh, at the beginning of the summer, I had 55% accuracy, or 45% error, basically no better than a coin toss. At the end of the summer, after months and months of toil, and I loved doing this, so I was working 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, at the end of that summer, I was up to 65% accuracy, or 33% error. Pretty terrible, not deployable, and so on. Guess what? That's actually how a lot of AI was at the time. We hardly saw any AI applications deployed in the late 90s, simply because while the algorithms were kind of there and the ideas were there, we just couldn't take it to accuracy that was accurate enough. Now, something happened starting in the early 2000s where people realized, you know, you don't necessarily have to improve the algorithms. You can just add more data. So this plot is actually from out of Microsoft in the early 2000s. And it shows on the far left, there's four different algorithms with 100,000 words. So the y-axis is accuracy. The x-axis is the number of words going from 200,000 words all, all the way up to 1 billion words. Okay. So on the left, you can see that there's accuracy between 75% and 85% with four different algorithms, you know, different things like KNN and so on. And basically, they're all kind of bad, right? The results are not usable. But as you add more data, and not just twice as much data, but 10x, 100x, 1,000x more data, accuracy goes up, 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 all the way up to 95%, 99%, 1% error, right? If you think about this, this is super embarrassing to AI people. You know why? Because it means you don't need a PhD um, playing around with algorithms in order to get accuracy good enough. You just need more data, right? And in fact, Google and Facebook started to figure this out in the mid-2000s. Google even published a paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. They go and buy satellite companies. They, uh, Facebook buys data from 200 people, uh, sorry, 200 organizations plus, in order to uh, augment to their data set and, and basically sell more ads, right? So overall, the world of AI has discovered the immense value of data. And this has actually been one of the things that deep learning has unlocked as well, because deep learning models have the capacity to handle the data. But even going with old school AI algorithms um, that are decades old, you add more data, you can get a lot more accuracy. AI loves data. So to unlock AI for good, we need to unlock the data. How do we do this? Well, we've been working on a way to do this with three different ways all around this public utility network. 
The first one is to connect the data haves with the data have-nots. And I've talked this about already uh, from the perspective of problem solvers and problem owners. But overall, imagine if we had a whole ecosystem of data marketplaces, not just one, but 10 or 100 or 1,000, all buying and selling data for various use cases. Um, just like we have for airlines, when we buy flight tickets, we can go to Expedia or Kayak or anywhere, and we're actually accessing the same underlying flight tickets. And of course, side by side with that, we have the AI Commons interfaces to give away data for free, and the data science tools for the people to consume. This is a substrate for the AI Commons, a substrate for people to create marketplaces. The second thing, we need to, in, uh, what about Commons data? You know, right now, there are 200 organizations, at least, with open public data sets. And these are really great data sets. You probably heard about them earlier. And um, there's even a website that describes them. But it's really hard to access each one and pull it in together. There's no common API for this. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of data that is even put, isn't even put out there, even though it could be if there is some incentive for it. So let's incentivize for that. And there's a challenge, of course. Um, there's this famous quote uh, I'm going to paraphrase. Data wants to be free. It also wants to be expensive. You know, it's free to copy the physics of bits. You know, copy, 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 copy. But at the same time, how do you compensate the creators? You know, if people are creating the data and putting it out there and the effort for it, right? So how do you compensate people for supplying data for free? Well, there's a superpower that blockchains have, incentives. You can get people to do stuff by rewarding them with tokens. I'll unpack this. So Bitcoin has an incentive. If you actually deep in, look into the Bitcoin deeply, Bitcoin gives you network rewards, Bitcoin tokens, if you add to its security. It defines security as hash rate. And every 10 minutes, um, if I'm contributing 10% of uh, security to the network, I can expect 10% of the network rewards. So in this case, it's 10% times 12.5 Bitcoin, 1.25 Bitcoins. So that's what Bitcoin is doing. It's paying people to add to its security using inflation. How well does it work? Well, this is an example of a data center doing nothing but mining bitcoins. Bitcoin itself has more flops than all top 500 supercomputers of the world combined. It's working really well. Uh, this is the hash rate. It's that you can actually view it as an objective function in the world of optimization. It's maximizing security over time, all with this single incentive. So going back to the question, how do you compensate people for supplying stuff for free? How do you resolve Stuart Brand's paradox? You give network rewards if people supply commons data. As simple as that. You can add staking so that there's no spam in this sort of thing too. But this is the core idea. The network prints tokens as inflation. And over time, those pe the people that get it are the people that supply the data. So that's the second way to unlock the data. There's one more, private data. So the most valuable data is private data. Now, of course, you might be thinking, oh, man, I don't want to give my data. It's my private data, you know, my DNA, whatever. That's not going to fly. So, so what do you do about it? And the, the, you know, related to this, um, I'll give, I'll give another example from health. A friend of mine, he's a genetic programming researcher. He builds models of cancer. He's got a data set of 100 people. He tells me he's a happy man if he can build a model from that. It's actually genetic data, so there's thousands of input variables. Um, then, of course, with thousands of input variables and just 100 data points, his models are terrible, <laughs> really terrible, unusable, right? So what he would love is to not just have data from one hospital, 100 people, but from 1,000 hospitals, uh, 100 million people. Then we can start to get serious accuracy in our models. Now, of course, there's a problem with this, privacy, right? This is going to be a giant data honeypot along the likes of Equifax with, which, with its hack of hundreds of millions of credit cards and others that we see almost daily. So more data is actually both good and bad. Less data. So if you have more data, we've got more accuracy. We can save more lives, et cetera. But of course, privacy goes down, data honeypots. If there's an exploit, it's terrible, right? So can we, can we resolve this trade-off somehow? Here's how. Bring the compute to the data with decentralized orchestration at the core. So you have this public utility network that makes it really easy to bring the compute to where the data is sitting in a privacy-preserving fashion. The data gets to save behind the firewall of each hospital, of each cell phone, et cetera. The model is trained there, and the model is stored there. Then anyone who wants to build a model on top, um, they don't even get to see the model. All they can do is see the, the querying at the end. That's it. So this is actually federated learning, but it's a twist. It's decentralized federated learning. At the lower level, you've decentralized the data. At the middle level, you've decentralized the orchestration, all the different steps of computation. And you've also decentralized the storage of the model itself at, with a, a rate limit to the queries so that the model itself can't be reverse engineered. Uh, so overall, this is actually how we resolve this paradox 
of bringing compute to the data, we can actually have accuracy. We can improve the number of lives saved and get all these other benefits without the issues of privacy. So these are the, the three ways of unlocking data. Now what I'm going to do is to, tar to talk about some of the benefits um, in terms of applications of AI and data. Uh, one use case, this is a nonprofit foundation out of South Africa called IXO. Ixo. And what they're doing is satellite data in the commons to verify the impact of forest restoration and water. So basically, um, you want to have a nice water supply overall, clean, et cetera. And it turns out that forests themselves, if you restore the forests, this can make a big improvement to the water supply. And then uh, if you have satellite data and you make it available easily, then, um, then you can actually see. So one thing leads to another to another. Who would have thought that water supply can be um, tracked and then improved simply by looking at satellite data? So it's, it's not just that, but it's a, it's a really big part. Another use case, uh, we're working with an organization um, out of Munich uh, called Connected Life. And uh, it's basically the, a similar use case to how I described for cancer before. In this case, it's starting with Parkinson's. So uh, they are trying to predict Parkinson's earlier so that um, once you have early stage detection of Parkinson's, you can treat it sooner, et cetera, et cetera. And they have this challenge of data sharing. They've, they're working with the TU Munich hospital um, where it's German data on German soil which can't leave the EU. Um, they're also working with the National University of Singapore. The data in Singapore can't leave Singapore. So how do you combine those, simply those two data sets to get better models? Well, the answer is bringing the compute to the data. And of course, they're not going to stop at just two, data, two hospitals. They will keep going to three, and then four, and then five. This is all early stages, so this is what they're working on right now. And of course, uh, why stop at just Parkinson's? Move on to Alzheimer's. Move on to all the different forms of cancer. We can finally um, resolve this challenge between more data and privacy. Another example is a World Economic Forum spin-off called Grow Asia, and it's really about helping farmers to allocate their fertilizer better. Um, so they have this fixed fertilizer, uh, fixed fertilizer budget, and they can increase their yields. We're iterating with the data authorities of the government of Singapore um, and other uh, government agencies um, to help them come up with better policies around data now that there is new technology that helps to resolve this trade-off better. And finally, uh, at last year's AI for Good Summit, uh, we announced, along with XPRIZE Foundation uh, and the ITU, um, a movement towards an overall AI Commons platform. And this is very exciting, and it's starting to gather momentum. And of course, as part of that, uh, we're very excited with Ocean Protocol, this decentralized public utility network, to be part of that. And in fact, there was a meeting in Montreal just two days ago about this very thing to help drive this thing forward. So I'll wrap up. I started with the question of how do you spread the benefits of AI and data? And the answer is do AI for good at scale via an AI Commons framework that unlocks data for AI. Thank you very much.